Welcome to Edgbaston Park Hotel. My name is Richard Black. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Social Sciences, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I've been asked to say, uh, before I say anything else, that this, night, this, evening, this evening's lecture is being live streamed over Facebook. So, hello on Facebook, and uh, please be aware. Um, uh, a notice about mobile phones, um, please don't switch your mobile phone off, but tweet furiously, um, and I believe it's uh, at fromage on that you have to uh, put in there. Um, so it's my job to introduce uh, Nick. Um, Nick Cheeseman is Professor of Democracy at the University of Birmingham, um, having joined the university in January 2017, uh, and I learnt just now having been born in Moseley, uh, so a Birmingham lad. He was formerly director of the African Studies Center at Oxford University, where he previously carried out his undergraduate, master's, and doctoral research in political science and development. So it's fantastic we prized you away from Oxford, Nick. Since arriving at Birmingham, Nick has taken up the role of research director in the International Development Department and co-leadership of the Fighting Gender Inequality Research Program, which has recently been developed under the auspices of the university's new Institute for Global Innovation. Nick received his PhD in 2008 for a thesis on the construction of political power in Kenya and Zambia. And his work has focused on democracy, elections, and development, specializing in topics such as party politics, populism, decentralization, and the historically rooted explanations of democratization. Over the last decade, he's concluded fieldwork on these issues in a range of African countries, including Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The articles that he's published, based on this research, have won a number of prizes, including the GIGA Award uh, for the Best Article in Comparative Area Studies in 2013, and the Frank Cass Award for the Best Article in Democratization in 2015. On average, Nick has published a book a year since finishing his doctorate. I am in awe. He's the author of Democracy in Africa, uh, Cambridge University Press, 2015, Institutions and Democracy in Africa, Cambridge University Press, 2018, and Coalitional Presidentialism in Comparative Perspective, uh, that's Oxford University Press, in 2018. In addition, he's the former editor of the Journal of African Affairs, founding editor of the Oxford Encyclopedia of African Politics, and editor of the Oxford Dictionary of African Politics. And taken together, uh, these publications have positioned Nick as one of the leading authorities on democracy and African politics in the world today. Um, and by the way, some of those books are for sale on the side, um, including the book that is the title of this lecture. So keenly aware that for knowledge to be truly valuable, it must be shared, um, Nick has invested great effort in engaging with policymakers around the world. As well as being an advisor to and writer for Kofi Annan's Africa Progress Panel, he regularly briefs international leaders on African policy when it comes to democracy and elections. His insights into how, into how best to promote development in Africa have also been in high demand, and he's often consulted on the politics of development such as a three-year period during which he advised the Lagos state government in Nigeria on the delivery of public services. More recently, Nick has joined the board of Oxfam as a trustee, and I was very pleased to see that the board were here last week talking to him, um, where he provides guidance on the design and impact of uh, development programs. Um, a frequent commentator on African and global events, Nick is also known by his Twitter handle, which I've already mentioned, and his work has a large following in a number of African countries, including in Kenya, where for a number of years he wrote a column in the Daily Nation, the most read newspaper in East Africa. His analysis has appeared in The Economist, Le Monde, Financial Times, Newsweek, The Washington Post, New York Times, BBC, Mail and Guardian, Daily Nation, and many more. In total, his columns and articles have been read over a million times, um, I guess somebody counted that. That's pretty impressive. And many of his interviews and insights have been, can be found on the website that he founded and co-edits, which is www.democracyinafrica.org. So tonight, Nick will be sharing some of the lessons from his most recent book, How to Rig an Election, available £10 over there. 
um, drawing on his personal insights of watching and researching elections over 10 years, How to Rig was the first book ever to be used as a front cover by The Spectator magazine and has been described as clear, punchy, and potentially revolutionary by Michaela Rong, author of Our Turn to Eat, and Essential Reading for Anyone Who Wants to Get Democracy Right Again by A.C. Grayling. That's all it's got me to say. So uh, I, with that, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Nick Cheeseman. Nick. Thanks very much, Richard. I feel under slightly more pressure than I did about two minutes ago. Um, I was going to deliver a lecture about how to rig an election as part of the kind of how to rig an election world tour. We've given this lecture in lots of different places. And then I was wavering on that last night because somebody pointed out to me that they were coming as a good friend to this lecture, but they had seen that lecture already. And then I got an email earlier today from Tim Horton, who anyone uh, in Birmingham will know is a wonderful colleague and does things like email you and say, have a good lecture today uh, because he's such a nice guy. And in doing so, he said, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to reflect on what you've done in your career and to thank people. And I thought, oh God, is that what you're supposed to do? Because I was going to stand up and give my how to rig an election and then try and flog you a couple of books. So in response to Tim's prompting, I rewrote the lecture this afternoon to try and do something very different. Um, and that prompted me to actually think about how the different bits of my research over the last 10 years have fit together. And it led me to realize something. I had a kind of epiphany. I realized that actually all of my work has been in a way about leadership. Now, that's not a surprise to any of you because most of you don't know me. So you're thinking, okay, fair enough. It was kind of a surprise to me, right? Because if you actually go back to what I sort of, the words I wrote down to have someone like Richard say what it says on my website, leadership actually doesn't appear at all. There's sort of stuff about institutions, elections, democracy, nothing about leadership being the common thread. So I rewrote the lecture so that it actually brings out this frame about leadership and trying to see my work and the history of my work as ways in which it plays into the question of why do leaders make the decisions that they do? And that's the lecture I'm gonna try and give you today. Now, I am gonna frame that still around how to rig an election because it's the thing that I've been thinking about the most and I should start off by saying that this is a co-authored book so anything that's good about the book is probably due to Brian. He can't be here today but he's a wonderful co-author. You will know that the last few years has seen an explosion of books that have discussed the downfall of democracy. Uh, Tim recently brought uh, Daniel Ziblatt, a fantastic scholar from the United States, over to talk about one of his books about how democracy dies. We have other books out there by people like Yasha Monk. We've also got a great book by David Runciman. And all of these books are talking about the fate of democracy. Are there signs that democracy is dem on the way out? Yasha Monk's book, The People Versus Democracy, posits that in a way the problem with democracy is its own permissiveness. Democracy will be eaten up from the inside out because of what it allows people to do. And what will happen over time, he argues, is that essentially what we think will be the case when we have democracy, i.e. liberal democracy, will turn into something very different, illiberal democracy. So democracy will kind of eat itself. The limitations of democracy will undermine the foundations of what we hold dear. The Levitsky and Ziblatt book makes a very different argument. They provide a historical reading of the collapse of democracies over time to project ahead and be very worried about the falling norm of inclusion. We are no longer tolerating dissent. We are no longer listening to people that disagree with us. We are no longer being accepting of difference and the right of opposition. And so their great concern is that actually we will kind of undermine the norm of inclusiveness and tolerance that underpins an effective democracy. David Runciman then comes in and says, I don't really agree with any of this. The future is not going to look like the past, but here's another set of concerns. All of these books are brilliant in their own way and all spell out important concerns about the way that democracy in countries like the United States and the United Kingdom might erode over the next 20 years. But they all, to me, have one thing in common, which is that they're rooted in quite a Western experience of democracy and a Western understanding of what the decline of democracy might look like. 
the idea, for example, think about that Levitsky and Ziblad argument. The idea that what's really problematic is that established norms of tolerance and inclusion will be broken down is rooted in an understanding that we have achieved consolidated democracy, that what we have is worth defending, and the risk is losing it. The reason we wrote this book is because we see the greatest threat to democracy coming from a very different source. It's not the erosion of the quality of democracy in countries that have achieved democratic status. It's the problem that many countries around the world that hold elections were never democracies at all. So the countries that we talk about in how to rig elections, and I will talk a little bit about the United States and the UK later, are not established democracies getting a little bit worse but countries that have always been locked in what political scientists like me would call competitive authoritarianism. Now, I'm not going to use too much jargon in this talk because I think it'll alienate a lot of people. I'm going to try and talk in language that doesn't use lots of political science terms. But it's important to talk a little bit before I start about what competitive authoritarianism means. And the idea is very simple. These are countries that hold elections and they hold multi-party elections. So lots of different parties compete for power. But they are also countries in which the other trappings of democracy do not hold. We do not see an independent electoral commission, for example. We do not see freedom of speech. We do not see freedom of association and freedom of movement. So we have the combination of an element of democracy in terms of the electoral system, but with the wider context of an authoritarian political system. And it's that combination of competition and authoritarianism that gives these countries their particularly distinctive politics. A politics that looks like democracy, but actually often leads to elections without change. And this book is really a book about how politics works in those countries, why elections get manipulated, what that means. I was recently, just yesterday, I uh, flew in back very late from a high level meeting on international election observation that was happening at the European Parliament. It was a particularly interesting meeting for two reasons. The first was that there was a sense of genuine kind of excitement, a possibility of change in the air. The second was that it was packed. And almost every speaker who took to the rostrum commented on the fact, these were mainly dignitaries, high-level political figures from the African Union, the European Union, and so on, commented on the fact that when they're normally used to speaking to half-empty rooms, this event on election observation was not only standing room only, as you can see from the photo I took, but had a listening room in a building adjacent that was also full. So why is everybody all of a sudden interested in election observation? I can tell you it wasn't like this about five years ago. The answer, of course, is that international election observers have gone from being the independent, neutral people who turn up to watch elections to being part of the controversy and part of the story because they are so often embroiled in watching elections in countries that are supposed to be democracy but have many of the trappings of authoritarianism, they have become increasingly controversial in their alleged refusal to call out bad quality elections. And just to show you this, I'm going to show you a cartoon from the Kenyan election of 2017. So what happened in the Kenyan election of 2017 was international observers did not condemn the election when they gave their initial statements. That was then, the result of the election was then petitioned to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court then ruled that the election was illegal. It was null and void, and a rerun had to happen. And in response to that, international uh, observers were lambasted by the opposition. And this cartoon demonstrates that. So this is a cartoon that is showing two observers, John Kerry and Thabo Mbeki, with egg on their face. Right? because they refused to call out the election, which was then ruled to be illegal by the Supreme Court. Now, my message, and this might not appeal to all of you, because it's fun to jump on international observers, there's a lot of beating up on them going around, is that actually all of the stereotypes about international observation are not true. It is not true that people are lazy. It is not true that they just go to capital cities and stay in nice hotels. It is not true that they don't do their jobs properly. It is not true that they are not conscientious, and it is not true that they don't get out and see the country or meet opposition or civil society leaders. In fact, the challenge to international observation and the reason why they are getting caught in this situation more and more and more lies in much deeper and more profound structural problems with the way in which elections are being managed in the countries in this category. And that's what I'm going to explain to you today. <clears throat> 
So the framing of the book starts like this. There is good news. There are more elections being held than ever before, right? And if, like me, you're an elections junkie, you want more elections. This is undoubtedly a good thing. But it is also, for international election observers, a challenge. Because as well as the fact that there are more elections than ever before, there are worse quality democracy. And as many of you will know in this room, we are now in a pronounced democratic recession. Let me show you what that looks like. The number of elections that we have around the world has gone from something like 30 a year in the 40s to almost 80 a year today. Almost all of these elections are now observed by one group or another. So we are at quite high level of observation. So the number of elections being observed has gone through the roof. The cost of election observation has gone through the roof. The number of staff you need to do observation has gone through the roof. At the same time, we have 12 years of democratic recession. So this is showing you using Freedom House data, the number of countries that move towards authoritarianism in a given year, the number of countries that get less democratic, which is the red line, and the number of countries that are becoming more democratic, which is the blue line. And what you can see is that every year for 12 years, the red line is greater than the blue line. The number of countries moving towards authoritarianism is greater than the number of countries moving towards democracy. Now, it's important to say at this point that this is just one way of measuring democracy. People may put their hands up later and say, can we talk about different ways of measuring democracy? Absolutely, we can talk about it for hours in the pub. I don't have time to get into it now. What I would say is that almost any way we measure democracy, we find similar patterns. Almost any of the indexes out there, some of which measure quite different things, tell us that we have seen a decline over the last 10, 12 years. The other thing I want to say very quickly, because it will come up in the Q&A if I don't, is I do not think that elections simply equal democracy. We're talking about elections in the book because we wanted to pick one particular way into the topic. Doesn't mean that elections are the be all and end all. In fact, the whole point of the book is about how fragile elections are when they, when they are held in a context where the other trappings of democracy are not also there. Now, one of the things that really struck us when we started doing the book, and I should say both Brian and I worked on Africa, and because of a lot of the media story you get about Africa, the things you hear in the press about Africa, we kind of thought African elections were going to be worse than elections elsewhere, right? That was just our kind of gut feeling. It was a basic assumption. We didn't even think about it. What we hadn't expected was how bad elections were in most other parts of the world. So this is data using the um, Electoral Integrity uh, Project data, fantastic project with Pippa Norris heading it up. And it gives a ranking for every election in the world from a scale of 1 to 10. 10 is the best quality election. So 10 is where you get everything right, even equal coverage in the media. You get equal access to finance. Everything is perfect. One is a terrible election. The election basically doesn't really happen. They just post the results on the polling station before it even opens. We've had those elections, by the way. We can talk about them later. What's really interesting is that on this 1 to 10 scale, almost every part of the world with new democracies looks relatively similar. Sub-Saharan Africa is there at 4.9, but Asia doesn't look much better at 4.8. The Middle East doesn't look much better at 5.4, and post-Soviet uh, Europe actually is worse at 4.6. So the message that we wanted to get across in the book is that we have a problem, and the problem is much bigger than you might think. And it's not just that the exceptional election here and there is poor quality. It's actually that poor quality elections have become the norm. And this is one of the reasons why life has got so hard for international election observers. They're having to go to more elections than ever before, and they're doing it in less democratic contexts in which the quality of elections is getting worse rather than better over time. And this relates to a second point that is important to get across just to get the kind of framing of how the lecture is going to go. Because in a sense, what we now see is a very different kind of authoritarianism than we would have seen in the past. Authoritarianism 1.0 if I was giving you a lecture 20, 30 years ago, I would have been talking about the average authoritarian regime somewhere like Africa would have been a one-party state or a military system. Potentially, I would have said there were a few personal dictatorships out there that were so based on one-man rule that they weren't really a one-party state or a military regime. But that's what we would have been talking about. They would have been highly repressive. They would probably have legitimated themselves with some claim to provide political stability and maybe some claim also to economic development if you think about Asian tigers. But they would not have held elections, at least multi-party ones. Today, the average authoritarian regime holds elections, professes to believe in some kind of human rights, claims to be a member of the international community, wants to be seen as a respectable nation. 
There are a small number of countries that don't fit this bill, right? Eritrea, until recently, didn't fit this bill. North Korea didn't fit this bill. But if you look at the vast majority of countries that I was talking about in that competitive authoritarian category, they're holding elections and they're making a play for legitimacy. And legitimacy is critical because of what it gives them. It gives people access to an international community. It gives access to international financial opportunities. It gives access for leaders to be able to be seen as credible and respectful and statesmanlike. So legitimacy has become a key touchstone. And legitimacy is critical to understanding why you need to rig an election and get away with it. Because, of course, 20, 30 years ago in authoritarianism 1.0, you didn't need to worry about getting away with your election rigging. If you were going to rig an election, you could do it blatantly. It wasn't as big an issue. Today, and I'll give you some concrete examples in a moment, we see regimes desperate to maintain the legitimacy of democratic practice, but using authoritarian strategies to ensure they never lose power. So what we do in how to rig an election is we develop a dictator's toolbox. The key strategies that if you're a dictator, you need to use to make sure you get to keep hold of power. And we identify six different strategies. These are different strategies that some of you will already know, right? So classic strategies, historical ones like gerrymandering, fixing constituency boundaries, vote buying, stuffing the ballot box, right? Different strategies that can be used. Now... This is where Tim comes in. At this point, the lecture would have gone on and I would have trotted through some really funny, you would have loved it, great examples, of um, election rigging around the world. But due to Tim, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. I'm going to try and develop a slightly different framework for how we can actually think about the types of manipulation strategies that different leaders actually use. Why do they vary? What does that mean? So we're going to start here. I want you to imagine that you are a dictator. Or if you like, you can call yourself a kind of reluctant Democrat. Now, that's going to be easier for some of you, maybe heads of department. No, I'm just joking, guys. Just joking. Um, members of the British cabinet, um, immigration officials in the UK government. Um, I want you to think about Machiavellian control. I want you to think about the real strategy for rigging an election. Let's say you're sitting down with your advisors. These might be international advisors, they might be domestic advisors. And you're thinking about, okay, what are the rigging strategies that are on the table? Which ones do we want to deploy in this election? I want you to think about two different dimensions on this. The first is that you've got strategies that are really high impact. They can be really successful. You know that if you do that, you're probably going to win an election. And then strategies that might give you a bit of an advantage, but they're not certain to get you over the line. And then I want you also to think about a second dimension. This is the level of risk that you will be exposed, and as a result of being exposed, you will lose that legitimacy that I was talking about a moment ago, that you will be exposed and embarrassed, and the election will not give you that bounce. So what I'm going to talk about for now is the four different possibilities that you can have to select for your rigging strategy. You can have this strategy right down here at the bottom. This is high risk and low impact. We call it amateur hour. The reason we call it amateur hour is because somebody, and we can't name a lot of the people who talk to us for the book in this live streamed on Facebook, but somebody who advises a president in Africa on such strategies described these strategies to us as amateur hour. He said, basically, if somebody's doing these strategies, they don't really know how to rig an election. If, if, someone, if you see someone do these, send them to me because they need help. Right? <laughs> these are the strategies that will get you in trouble. They're kind of obvious and they don't get you over the line. They don't help you win. Up there, we've got quiet rigging. These are strategies that tend to go under the radar. You can do them well ahead of time, but actually, they're not necessarily that successful. For me, a classic example of this is vote buying. People often think that vote buying is successful, but actually, most of the academic evidence suggests that the impact of vote buying can often be marginal. And many of us, if you actually work in a country that's a competitive authoritarian state with high levels of vote buying, you will have probably had the experience of sitting in a bar with a politician who is drowning his sorrows, damning the public because they took the money and they didn't give him the votes. Right? I've been there talking to a politician who will say to you, you know, I gave at least 3,000 people some money and I got 600 votes. So 2,400 of these people are liars. Vote buying isn't necessarily a reliable strategy unless you can enforce the contract. Right? It's a contract, but it's very difficult to enforce if there's a secret ballot. 
this strategy down here, high impact, high risk, is your kind of, you know, at any cost strategy. You are desperate to keep power. You are going to keep power no matter what. But it's going to be clear to everybody what you've done. For example, you can send in the troops. You can put tanks on the street. You can refuse to allow opposition voters to get to polling stations by beating them up with the police. That'll win you the election, right? You can guarantee victory that way, but everybody in the world will see you doing it, and in so doing, you will lose that legitimacy. So this is the zone that if you're desperate and other strategies haven't worked, you often start to operate, but you don't want to be there. Our friend who called this one on the, on the bottom left amateur hour said to us, this is not how the professionals do it. So I said to him, how do the professionals do it? He said, you want the sweet spot. The sweet spot is up here in the top right-hand corner, right? The sweet spot is high impact, low risk. What's that? Gerrymandering is a good option, right? Something like gerrymandering, why? Because if you fix constituency boundaries so that you get more seats than you should in parliament ahead of time, it's a technical fix, it's done in a bureaucratic way, it's usually done by a committee, it's usually not reported on by the media, it doesn't generate public protests, it's done before international observers get on the ground, that's a really low risk strategy. But it actually has a really profound impact on parliament and your ability to retain power. So that's the kind of thing that's up there. Now, I recently published a book with two wonderful colleagues in Oxford who I wanted to uh, just give some credit to, Paul Chasty and Tim Power, who taught me an incredible amount about coalitions, presidentialism, and comparative research while we were putting together this project. And it so started to think after Tim's intervention that you know you should think more about how you've developed as a scholar, that actually the way that I now think about election rigging is profoundly indebted to what they taught me and the work that we did in this book. What we tried to ask ourselves in this book is how do presidents manage fragmented legislatures? One of the things that most of us don't realize, even if those of us working in political science, is that the dominant presidents we think about in many developing countries or new democracies, those people who are rigging those elections and are using those authoritarian strategies, a lot of them don't have a majority in parliament. Right? A lot of them are actually relying on a form of coalition or politics to get the job done in parliament. Because what you will often see is a president like Uhuru Kenyatta in Kenya who will win a first round victory in the presidential election, his party will not guarantee him a majority in parliament. And so there's a fantastic literature that's been developed within Latin America, in particular in Brazil, by PhD students and high quality political scientists, that describes how these presidents actually manage politics. Now, if we go all the way back to classic literature by people like Juan Lintz, Lintz argued that presidentialism was going to be bad for democracy. And one of the reasons he thought presidentialism would be bad for democracy is that actually it would lead to deadlock. We would actually see parliaments and presidents in deadlock. We would see conflict between the two. The second wave of that debate said, actually, it doesn't seem like presidentialism is so incompatible with democracy, but the real problem is when presidents have to face multi-party coalition Multi -party, fragmented multi-party parliaments. Why? Because it's under those conditions that presidents struggle to manage parliaments. If a president's got a majority in parliament, who cares about having a barrier, having um, a clash? But if we actually see fragmented parliaments, the coordination problems create a divide between parliament and the president, and that's what brings down democracy. And a recent wave of researchers, as included now, say actually even that can be overcome. It can be overcome by presidents acting like prime ministers. So what we actually see is presidents who actually get involved in the day-to-day nitty-gritty of forming complex parliamentary coalitions. And what we did in this book is we tried to work out how. What is the set of tools that they could use to manage complex coalitions and effectively get their agenda across? So we identified five classic tools that uh, uh, political leaders use to manage coalition politics. Things like cabinet formation, things like um, being able to make um, things like pork barrel politics, giving people amounts of the budget, and so on. And in doing so, we developed this toolbox, right? And as I was thinking about this earlier today and thinking about what Tim saw, I think that's why when we came to write How to Rig an Election, we liked the idea of a toolbox of presidential strategies. But then it started making me have a second thought. When we wrote this book, we decided that what was really important was not any one tool, but how the tools were used in combination. 
Because when we talk to presidents and parliamentarians, and we did this in nine countries and three different continents around the world, what we found was that almost all of the MPs and presidents agreed that the same set of tools were used, but they were used in different combinations depending on the requirements facing the president. So different balances and mixtures of tools were used to get the job done at any one time. And that then made me reflect back on what we've been discussing when it came to electoral politics. And I realized that we've been talking too much about an individual strategy of rigging, and what we really needed to be talking about was a toolbox of complementary strategies of rigging. So what we discuss at the end of this book is actually how leaders have a kind of portfolio. They have a portfolio of different strategies that they use. And when certain tools that they might want to use become less effective, they use more of another. Certain combinations of tools turn out to be particularly effective in getting a leader's agenda through a complex parliament. And certain ones turn out to be much less effective. And it made me realize that actually, if we come back to the coin about elections, what we see is not people choosing one of these electoral strategies, but a combination of options that allows them to draw across all four. In other words, it's not just one point on the graph, it's a portfolio of selection of different risk profiles and different um, effectiveness profiles across the board. So this is a sort of more reasonable reflection of what it might look like, not just one strategy being selected, but three or four. But going beyond that, as we were discussing when it came to presidentialism and legislatures, it's not just that leaders select a number of options, they give different weight to different options depending on the situation that they face. So if we think about the size of these dots representing their significance or how much a leader relies upon them, the situation might look rather more like this. Now, that then begs a question. If leaders are picking complex combinations of portfolios of different types of strategies of rigging to get the job done, and they're doing so in order to get the combination of risk and effectiveness that seems best for them, how do they make that decision? Is it just random? When I wrote my first book, Democracy in Africa, I argued against a lot of the way in which African leaders had been treated in the literature. There's far too many pieces out there that treat African leaders as if they're basically individuals who operate without institutions. That essentially what happens is if you get a good leader, you democratize, and if you get a bad leader, you end up as an authoritarian state. Right? So if you were using that kind of argument, you would look at Africa in the early 1990s and you would say, Ghana got Jerry Rawlings, he turned out to be a good guy, Ghana got lucky, Ghana got democracy, Kenya got Daniel Moy. Daniel Moy turned out to be a bad guy, Kenya had electoral violence, Kenya got unlucky. It would all be about the individual and the personality rather than the underlying structures. And this has been a long-running theme within African studies in which for many, many years we've seen people effectively argue that African politics is institutionalist, that we can treat it as if it's really a system of personal rule. And what I argued about in this book was that actually that's not true. The real reason that Rawlings was able to make some of those decisions was because of some of the background conditions in Ghana at the time. The real reason that Moy made some of the decisions he made was because of the background conditions at the time. So then that made me wonder, how can we actually theorize what makes a leader reform and what makes a leader repress? How can we actually come up with a more complex model that would explain that? So what I argued, and I went back here to the classics, right? Whenever you get stuck, you go back to the classics. So I was stuck in Spain, failing to write this book, and I went back and I read Robert Dahl. And Robert Dahl, for those of you who don't do democracy, is one of the all-time classics. And Dahl starts with this beautifully simplistic idea, right? which is so simple it's deceptive. He says, well, of course, leaders allow for reform when they see reform to be less threatening than repression. Right? So when they see the cost of reforming to be lower than the cost of repressing, they're going to go for the reform option. So if you like graphic images, look at this. If not, ignore it. Um, and what you could see here, right, is a graphic image where you've got the costs of reform on the left, the acceptability of the costs um, of repression on the bottom. And what Dahl is saying to us is, look, you're going to get democracy wherever you are on the left side of that line, wherever you're in that shaded area. When a leader feels that the threat to him is lower for reforming than it is to repressing. And that led me to think, well, how do we know? Right? What is it that shapes the costs of repression and the costs of reform. So I started to interview leaders and to try and get a sense of how they thought about whether or not to reform and whether or not to repress. 
And they said to me, well, one of the things we think about is how long can I keep this up for? So if I face a really strong, really unified opposition, I don't think I can keep this up for too long. So I start to think the cost of reform, uh, the cost of oppression might be insurmountable. They might be too great. If I'm living in a recession, if I've got no money, if I can't afford to pay the military, I actually think the costs of repression are too high. Because I think sooner or later, if I keep sending the police and the military out and not paying them, there's going to be a coup and they're going to rebel. So I start to think, actually, it's not feasible. If I face really strong institutions and a really strong rule of law, I can't actually use repression in the way that I want to because I'm constrained by the organizations of which I'm a part. And therefore, actually, oppression becomes less viable as a long-term option. So these are the kinds of things that make leaders think that actually long-term repression is not viable. Now, personal morality comes in here as well, right? There are just some leaders who are not prepared to do certain things to their citizens, and there are other leaders who are. So the argument is not that morality doesn't come in, not that individuality doesn't come in, but that all of these other structural conditions play in here as well. What about the acceptability of reform? There are two main things that come out of my elite interviews in Africa on this. The first is straightforward. What is the benefit of office? Leaders who see that there are opportunities to be proud, have status, be economically successful out of office are much more likely to be willing to stand down. But also, leaders who fear the threat of reprisals. And in the book, we actually show that the single greatest explanation of a rigged election is not how much leaders might expect to make in terms of corruption, it is actually the threat to the leader in terms of what might happen to them when they stand down. Because for 30 years in sub-Saharan Africa, over 60% of the leaders who stood down were either sent into exile, assassinated, imprisoned, or had their economic uh, properties confiscated. In that context, there's not an awful lot of an incentive to accept the cost of reform. Now, there are three things that are really important on both sides of this ledger. The first is natural resources. If you have natural resources, you are going to be able to sustain the costs of repression because you have the money you need to fund your military and your police. You are going to be less resistant to international pressure, but also the benefits of office are going to be higher because the amount of money that you can make from staying in power is going to be greater. If you have really strong institutions, you probably are less able to accept the individual benefits of office because you face greater constraints. But you also probably face greater constraints to deploying things like repression, deploying the military in civil matters. And the relationship to the international community is very important on both sides of this ledger as well. Because if you have geostrategic importance and you can manipulate uh, international leaders, for example, as Jonathan's work on Uganda has shown, and you're able to actually use that as a way of gaining an international pass for not promoting democracy, then sustaining repression becomes much more viable. But if you're in a weak situation and you desperately need the support of the international community, then reform becomes a much more attractive option. Now, that's a lot to take in, but what I want to give you now is two profiles of risk that we developed um, over the last couple of hours to try and account for what's going on in Zimbabwe right now and what happened in Kazakhstan in 2005 to give you a concrete example of what it looks like when countries place differently on these two uh, ledgers. So this is Zimbabwe in 2018. Zimbabwe in 2018 is a classic country in need of international legitimacy. Naturally, in this country, we see elections being used as an instrument of foreign policy. The whole way in which elections are actually introduced is explicitly to try and encourage the international community to see Zimbabwe and President Mnangagwa as members of the international community. Why was that so critical in the Zimbabwean context? It was essential because President Mnangagwa had come to power in a military transition. The government was desperate to avoid that transition being labeled a coup. Had it been labeled a coup, it would have been an unconstitutional transfer of power. Had it been unconstitutional, the African Union would have had to suspend Zimbabwe, and countries like the United States would have found it much harder to re-engage financially, which would have had serious implications for the ability of Zimbabwe to gain access to IMF and World Bank funding, which it desperately needs to kickstart its economy. So President Mnangagwa plowed ahead to elections and changed a number of things. He invited international observers to observe elections in Zimbabwe for the first time for a long time. So in the way he managed the elections, he understood that he wanted to retain control and he wanted to win, but he now had to do so in a way that enabled him to maintain that legitimacy. 
Because had he used any of the strategies that we were talking about in that bottom right-hand box, high impact, high risk, it would have been exploded. A, international observers from multiple different uh, countries are now on the ground watching the election. B, anything that undermines the legitimacy of the regime, threatens the long-term economic recovery of the country, and therefore the legitimacy on which the government is actually basing its, um, its control. Kazakhstan in 2005 was a radically different case. This is one of the world's biggest oil exporters. It's also got massive holds of, holdings of gas. At the point of the 2005 elections, it was ranked as being one of the least free countries in the world by democracy ratings agencies such as Freedom House. The fact that it had a developed state capacity and that it had significant access to natural resources meant that Kazakhstan was relatively impervious to international pressure. And so what we saw in the run-up to this election was a campaign of terror. Newspaper editors who published stories about the corruption within the ruling party were actually targeted, and in some cases we saw animals decapitated and left outside the offices. In one case, an office was firebombed. In other cases, opposition leaders were beaten up, and so on. So all of these strategies were used. It was clear to everybody that the election was being manipulated. It was effective because that level of repression forces people to go home and not turn out to vote, but it undermined the legitimacy of the government. But the legitimacy of the government didn't matter because this wasn't a government that was playing the game for legitimacy. It didn't need to because of its economic holdings at the time. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about now is uh, some of the great examples of electoral manipulation that fall into these categories. I've kind of talked a little bit about the profiles of manipulation and why leaders select different strategies or portfolios. I want to now give you some concrete examples of actual strategies. So let's go back to the kind of amateur hour strategies. What are the really bad examples of election rigging that people have cited to us around the world? One of the best is Azerbaijan 2013. This was an election in which the president won with 84% of the vote. But in an attempt to make the election look credible, they decided that they would introduce a new app. They would introduce an app that would allow people to see the results of the election ahead of time. Wonderful idea, right? Transparent. <laughs> you can guess what's coming, right? <laughs> the people who downloaded the app found, surprisingly, that a day before the election had taken place, the results were already there. The government said that this couldn't have been true, that actually what was happening was that they were just running a test. The problem was the candidates they said they were running a test from were the previous election, and the candidates' names that came through to the people on the app were the candidates from the current election. Now, this is bad in a number of ways, right? One, it's kind of um, incompetent, but also this isn't actually gonna help you win the election. This is low impact, in a sense, high risk. But it also tells us something very important, okay? The way in which leaders think about manipulating new technology to create a veneer of democracy when actually that technology is just as vulnerable to manipulation behind the scenes. Now, the Azerbaijan example is a little bit funny, but you might think that this doesn't happen anymore. But I want to give you an example that I think is almost egregious from Zimbabwe earlier this year. What I'm showing you now is the ballot paper for Zimbabwe in 2013. And what you can see, and I want you to notice two things about this ballot paper. The first thing I want you to notice about this ballot paper is that it's alphabetical. So if you look, even Mr. Mugabe is not able to be placed number one on the ballot paper in 2013. The second thing I want you to notice about this ballot paper is that it's a single column running all the way down as per the official electoral regulations. I'm now going to show you the ballot paper in 2018. Now, you'll notice two things. One, it's still alphabetical, but mysteriously we now have two columns. You'll also notice that they haven't separated the columns evenly as you might do if you were trying to minimize the use of paper, but they've surprisingly left this space in the bottom right-hand corner. The reason, of course, is because President Munangagwa wants to be first on the ballot paper. Unable to be first because of the alphabetical rule in Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission has helped him out by helpfully breaking the column, artificially creating a second column so that his name is first. And as most people who study uh, reading will tell you, the top right-hand corner for most English people is the first part of the page that you look at when you actually turn a new page. Now, this is kind of silly in a number of ways. It's silly in that the Zimbabwean government had managed this set of risk strategies very effectively to actually manipulate the election in ways that were very hard to detect for outside observers. And yet this, which is a strategy which really doesn't get you too many extra votes, 
all of a sudden undermine confidence in the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission's independence amongst observers and amongst opposition parties in one foul blow. Okay, I'm going to speed up, otherwise I'm going to run out of time. That's the first set of strategies. A second set of strategies is the ones that I said are really effective, but they actually lose you legitimacy. This is Brian, my co-author from the book, sitting down with the former president of Madagascar, Mark Ravalomanana. And this is just after the 2006 uh, presidential elections. And he had a fantastically clever, ingenious strategy for winning that elections. He closed airports. Now, to tell you why closing airports won in the election, I have to take a step backwards. In Malagasy law, to be a presidential candidate, you have to, have to, submit your ballot paper in person, your registration papers in person. His opposition, main opposition candidate, had been forced into exile and was outside of the country. So every time the opposition candidate tried to fly in, Mr. Ravadamana closed all the airports. Now, this is an intriguing strategy for two reasons, and there's a lot of this to come in the talk. This is a strategy in which a leader manipulates an election not by flouting the law, not by breaking it explicitly, but by manipulating the law or enforcing it in a specific way. And this is one of the things that becomes very difficult for international election observers. So let's see what happens in this case. The opposition candidate brings a case to the courts. The courts consult the rule book. The rule book says if a candidate does not submit their materials on time themselves, they must not be on the ballot paper. The court upholds the verdict. Observers are now asked, what do they think of the court's decision? What do you say as an international observer? On the one hand, the court has made the right decision. The candidate did not hand their ballot papers in on time. They should not be on the ballot paper. On the other hand, you know that this is a wholly illegitimate strategy. The key thing, and this is really important, it comes out in Brian's brilliant PhD thesis, is that this happens far more than you would expect. Candidates ruled out on the basis of spurious legal challenges, that their party is not national enough, that their party um, has too many connections to inter other international countries. And in most of these cases, it increases the margin of victory by 20 to 30%. But only about half of these cases are called out and ruled out as credible elections by international election observers. Violence and repression, of course, is another strategy that we see in this category. You know, if you think about the Zimbabwean elections of 2008, Robert Mugabe basically lost the first round to the opposition challenger Morgan Changarai. The election went to a second round. Many people felt that Changarai was going to win in the second round, and ZANU-PF government decided that wasn't going to happen. They sent out a range of different thugs and state security forces. The level of violence was so great that opposition campaigning had to stop. And in the end, opposition leader Mun Changarai dropped out of the race for fear of the damage that was being done to his own people. So this is using violence to get the job done. As soon as that happened, Ms. Uh, Mugabe knew he was going to be in power. But he had to take the legitimacy hit. He had to accept a power-sharing government with Changarai's prime minister because he'd done it so blatantly and in a way that international observers were clearly going to call out and therefore undermine the legitimacy on which his government depended. Stuffing the ballot box, of course, is another strategy that kind of falls into this category. It's quite difficult to stuff the ballot box really, really well. You can do it if you've got a fantastic network and you can do it if you've got a great mechanism behind the scenes, but if you do it at the last minute, it can go wrong. And there's a great example of how it goes wrong in the book. Because the problem is you don't always know how much you need to do. Who can tell me who this man is? President yes, Alexander Lukashenko. And he has a fantastic line, which we quote in the book, which is about how sometimes as an authoritarian president you have to rig elections down. And the reason why you have to rig elections down is because everybody's scared of you. So this is the story that we told in Belarus. This is, by the way, one of me and Brian's favorite pieces of political graffiti. Isn't that pretty good? <laughs> it's pretty good, right? So the story goes like this. He's picked a number. And I actually wrote this down because I want to read this out to you. I think this is great. He says, I gave the order, this is after the election goes wrong, I gave the order to change the amount I won by from 93% to 80%. Because 90%, well, just psychologically, that's not well received. This is a leader, right, thinking about trying to take that legitimacy with him. And the story that we got from one of his aides is as follows. 
they were asked to deliver 78%. That was seen to be a good margin of victory. 78% tells the opposition they lost, tells international observers you don't need to look into the finer details because I won by so much, you're not going to find enough votes to make up that difference. But it's credible. It's not 90%. It's not banana republic. But they're scared, right? Because, hey, you're a dictator and you're known for being demanding. So they say, well, okay, we need to deliver. So if we're going to deliver and we need to get 79 or 78, let's ask for 81. Okay, so you ask for 81 from your provincial level guys. But your provincial level guys now have to talk to the next guys down. And they say, well, I don't know, we don't want those guys are pretty tough. We don't want to not get, you know, 81. So you ask for 83. There are five levels. This is why he won the election with 93% of the vote and had to rig it down. So stuffing the ballot box, right, seems like an easy strategy to manipulate an election, but turns out actually to be much more complicated than you might at first think. So what is the sweet spot? The sweet spot of electoral manipulation is a range of strategies I'll talk about now. Who knows what this is? Where is it? Adam, you must know this. As a US politics expert, you must know where this is. Uh, Illinois. This is Illinois, and we're talking about the Latin earmuffs. This is known as the Latin earmuffs because this is an electoral district, and if you turned it round, it would look like earmuffs, and it's been designed especially to pack in all the Latino voters in the area. Now, there's a massive debate about whether or not this constitutes gerrymandering. Republicans say, this is gerrymandering, how can you have a district that looks like that? In some places, this district is so thin, it is one road, right? Some of these lines are one road. But the counter argument is, actually, if you want to have voting districts that do not marginalize minority voices and allow people to gain representation, in some cases, you may need to draw strange districts that actually pack people together in order to allow them to have a voice. Otherwise, you might risk making the minorities in lots of different areas and therefore undermine political representation. So there's an ongoing debate about how bad things like this are. The point is that in many parts of the world and in many parts of America, that debate isn't really there, that we just see the manipulation of the design of constituencies to get people elected. Um, we say this is a sort of public information service because everywhere we've talked about gerrymandering, people think there was an Irish politician in uh, Dublin called Gerrymander. So we feel like for, to get it right, we must say this. It was actually uh, in the United States, it was Elbridge Gerry, um, who was a very important figure in the history of the United States. He was someone who actually refused to sign the US Constitution because he believed that there should be a Bill of Rights and he was someone who helped to write the US Bill of Rights. Sadly for him, he is not known for helping to write the US Bill of Rights. He is instead known for helping to draft, I think it was Senate um, constituencies or signing into law, Senate constituencies, that were said to be so warped that a cartoon of the time drew them in the shape of a salamander. And so we have Jerry, Salamander, gerrymander, and that's where the term gerrymander comes from. Now, gerrymandering is significant for two reasons. One, it gives ruling parties inbuilt advantages in the parliament, but two, there is a big debate about whether it also leads to a more negative form of politics. Why? Because if you generate constituencies in which essentially only one party can win and you deliberately design them in that way, then the candidates in those constituencies don't have to worry about the national election, so they don't worry about covering the middle ground. They worry about not being outmaneuvered in the primary. And if you worry about not being outmaneuvered in the primary, your instinct is always to watch your more extreme flank, right? If you're left, to watch the more left flank, the right, the more right flank. So this form of electoral manipulation has two negative consequences. One, that it creates an unfair playing field, but two, that it may have an impact on polarization. And the relationship between gerrymandering and polarization in the United States is a very live one, the subject of a lot of political science debate right now. The next strategy, and this was pretty much the main topic of conversation at the meeting I was in in Brussels, is about digital manipulation of the elections. And almost everybody who was there identified digital processes as the biggest threat to the quality of elections and to election observation going in to the next 10 years. There were two dimensions to this. One, actual electronic voting. So we do see a small number of countries around the world. I don't know if any of you know this, but the Democratic Republic of Congo is planning to go ahead with electronic voting this year. And of course, the United States and some other European and Latin American states have electronic voting. But there have been a number of concerns raised about the safety of these machines. 
uh, researchers, I think it was the University of Michigan, were so frustrated by the lack of officials responding to their emails about the vulnerability of their machines that they actually hacked into one of them and made it play the university fight song. When no one responded to that, they actually hacked into another one and turned it into a Pac-Man game. Over time, there have been iterations of election machinery and election templates that have tried to strengthen how good the machines are. We haven't yet seen a machine be developed that university researchers have not been able to hack. That's a reasonably significant concern if you actually have electronic voting. And I should say, in some cases, the electronic voting machines do not have a paper slip, which means that there is no recount possibility if you don't believe the number that the machine gives you. The second dimension, of course, is fake news in Cambridge Analytica and the fact that we are worried that the information that we receive is no longer independent or impartial or unbiased. Now, of course, the smart ones in the room are thinking, well, it never was, and this is, of course, true, right? Manipulating information goes back as long as politics. But what is new now, I think, is the extent to which it's difficult to work out who's actually doing the manipulation. And one of the big strings that I think is most important to discuss is not the capacity of an organization like Cambridge Analytica to use fake news, but the fact that almost everything Cambridge did, apart from the very extreme stuff and the, the personal data theft, was actually legal in most countries around the world. And that most countries that fall into the competitive authoritarian category that I'm talking about don't have data protection laws, and they don't have campaign um, media laws, and therefore almost everything that Cambridge did would not have officially broken a law in those states. Which again makes it very difficult for international observers because the number one thing international observers are supposed to be doing is enforcing the domestic rules that govern the election, not applying a broader international standard. So just to pull the lecture to a close, I want to talk about the final bit of the picture that's perhaps worrying as we move forwards. And that's what I call, and Brian calls in the, in the book, the sort of worrying trend over the last 10 years of authoritarian learning. Now you get the picture, right? Authoritarian learning, the strategies of different authoritarian leaders learning from each other, the ways in which different mechanisms of manipulation are crossing borders and being deployed in different places. Now if we go back to my very simple kind of diagram from the beginning, you can think of different strategies that, depending on how you do them, can be more or less effective. So I described to you at the beginning vote buying. And I said, in many cases, vote buying doesn't work very well because you give people money and you have to hope they go and vote for you, but maybe they don't. But what I'm going to show you in a minute is that clever authoritarians have found a way of making that much more effective. At the same time, other strategies like political violence, I said to you, is really dangerous because violence is usually detected and detected violence usually leads, leaves, uh, leads to significant problems and challenges from electoral observers. But what if you can get the same effect of political violence without actually shedding any blood? So, let's start with vote buying. Vote buying is a problem because you're never sure if you actually get the value for your money. But there are two ways that you can try and ensure that you do. One is surveillance. One of the things that we've seen in a number of elections in Africa recently is leaders attempting to generate the information they need to make sure that the vote was delivered. There are two ways in the main that we've seen this. On the one hand, people actually going in, ticking the ballot paper and taking a photograph on it on their smartphone to prove that they voted a certain way. Second, most elections that I observe in Africa have a feature that is there for illiterate voters. And the feature is that illiterate voters and blind voters are allowed to say to the returning officer out loud, I would like to nominate someone in this room to vote on my behalf. And what you can then do is say, I will nominate either this returning officer or, under most laws, a party agent. And so the voter who has taken the bribe will say to the party agent, I would like you to vote on my behalf. Please put the cross in the box of President X. The person puts the cross in them, there's no question that the $10 that was given has generated the vote. Now this is happening in a small number of countries right now, but it does have a significant implication. Because one of the things that it's actually doing is it's taking away from the secrecy of the ballot. It's taking away the ability of the voter to say, I'm going to take money from everyone and vote with my conscience. The second strategy, of course, is slightly different. This is uh, President Yuri Museveni of Uganda. And what he's doing here is he's giving over a big bag of cash. Now, this triggered a massive debate in Uganda and online. People criticized him. They said, this is vote buying. This is outrageous. You're trying to rig the election. And Museveni said, no, I'm not. I'm sustaining a relationship I've had with a community that supported me over a long period of time. 
I'm using resources to deliver local development, and I'm actually taking part in activity which is seen as being locally legitimate for myself as a leader of this community. Now, that was partly self-serving. Right? It was a partly self-serving argument. This is actually development. This is actually about long-term relationships. But it also hits at a kernel of truth, which is that what our research shows, and this comes from a separate research project I'm doing with Gabrielle Lynch and Justin Willis on the moral economy of elections in Africa, is that where you can persuade people that you are genuinely with them, where you can show people that you've provided development over time, vote buying makes people feel that they have a moral obligation to you and they worry about not voting for you. So we find lots of people who say to us, I took the money and I did worry about not voting for him because I felt like I had entered into an obligation. Where that money comes and people feel that they haven't seen you for 20 years and you have no relationship to the community, people don't have that qualm at all. They say, I don't feel any need to vote for him. He just went and stole the money and he came and gave me a little bit back. So this is rightfully mine anyway. So that ability to generate that relationship over time can turn the vote buying into a much more effective strategy. Second, violence. In the Zimbabwe election of 2018, there was very little violence. We didn't see the kind of violence that I talked about in 2008 at all. As I said, this had to be an election that looked good. It had to be an election that passed muster for the international observers. I'm talking about before the elections now. Some of you will know there was post-election violence before the elections. Instead, we saw something that in Zimbabwe is called shaking the matchbox. What does shaking the matchbox mean? Shaking the matchbox basically is what you do when you want to scare people and you've already hurt them. If you've burnt someone's house down, you don't have to burn it down again. You just have to stand outside shaking the matchbox and they get the idea. So what we get in Zimbabwe from NDI focus groups and from Afrobarometer survey data is lots of reports from people experiencing what they call subtle violence. Not being allowed to go to an opposition rally, being warned about their political behavior, being identified by the traditional leader in their area as someone who might not have the right kind of political thinking. They feel that they are being surveilled and watched and they are told at night and sometimes by security forces that they need to keep in mind what happened last time not enough people voted for the president. Right? So you get a message that has the same connotation as the physical violence, but delivered in a way that is almost impossible to observe and detect. Most of the international observers working in Zimbabwe in 2018 were aware that this message was being used, but they had two problems. One, it was very difficult to identify the magnitude of the problem and record it. Two, it was hard to know whether this was a strategy driven by President Mnangagwa or, as those sympathetic to him said, this is the kind of muscle memory of an authoritarian regime and he's doing his best to prevent it. Now, if we put all of these different strategies together, the ways in which ineffective strategies are being turned into more effective ones, the ways in which risky strategies are being made less risky, we can understand why the level of turnover around the world, electoral turnover, is actually pretty low. If we look at a global figure, something like 20 to 30 percent of elections are won by the opposition. So the vast majority of elections are won by ruling parties. That's partly because incumbents have advantages that may be legitimate, like being able to set the electoral cycle and being able to set the business cycle. But it's also because of the strategies that I've just talked about. And if we look at specific regions that have new democracies, what we actually see is that after a splurge of transfers of power, often soon after elections are reintroduced, we see that process of authoritarian learning leading to very low levels of transfers of power. So in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, we are now back to the same rate of transfers of power that we saw in the 1960s. So the reason we wrote the book was not to depress you all. We did a talk in Parliament uh, few weeks ago and they told us it was the, um, the first part of the talk was the most depressing talk they'd had that year and they'd had four talks on Brexit. Right? So that's, that's pretty brutal. But we wrote the book not for that but to try and point the way forwards, right? to try and suggest ways in which election observers can be strengthened. You know, for example, one of the things we need to start talking about is with limited resources, how do election observers actually monitor social media? How do you monitor social media in countries which speak 15 different languages? How do you develop ways of identifying whether technology used for elections has been hacked? How do you develop ways of actually identifying the significance of subtle violence and deterring it? 
One of the problems for election observers is that they've responded very well to many of the challenges I've identified. They are not, as I said at the beginning, lazy. They are not people who sit around the pool. They send, for example, long-term observers to pick up on precisely the kinds of more invisible strategies I've talked about. They employ data analysts and where they can, IT specialists to try and get insights into these processes. They distribute people across the country to try and get representative pictures. But the problems they face are to some extent beyond their control. They face, for example, a broader international community that is significantly less committed to democracy promotion than it was in the past. As I said earlier, international election observers are not allowed to intervene. They may not get involved in elections. What they are allowed to do is identify problems and make recommendations. They are not allowed to actually intervene directly to stop election rigging in process. For that and for the recommendations they make to be implemented, they have to rely on international leaders and the international community on the ground. And that is why the rollback of democracy promotion in the United States under President Trump, but also the lack of attention that the European Union and Britain can right now spend on these issues in the context of Brexit is so dangerous because it creates a situation in which international election observers do not necessarily feel that the international community has their back. How can we help them? Two final slides and I promise I'll stop. So, the other book that I brought out this year was called Institutions and Democracy in Africa, and this book was actually dedicated to uh, Professor Nigel Bowles, who's over there, who was my great uh, inspirational tutor, one of my first ever tutors, so I'm very, very grateful that he's here. He taught me everything I know about institutions and some. Um, and in that book, we tried to make this argument again about the fact that in most of the countries we're talking about, institutions may be manipulated, but they do matter. And one of the things that we can do is actually start to use academic research more effectively to help observers. So for example, we can show observers which elections are likely to be close and which aren't. This is data from the African context that I present in this book. And what it basically shows is that where an incumbent candidate stands, they win something like 85% um, of all elections. So when the president that is in power stands in the election, they win 85% of the time. When that president can't stand, because for example, presidential term limits have been respected, all of a sudden, the opposition wins 45% of those elections. So you've got a one in 10 chance to a one in five chance of the opposition, so one in 10 chance to a one in two chance of the opposition winning when the incumbent stands down. That means that post-term limit elections become the critical moment for elections potentially being close and generating controversy. That's useful to know. Another piece of research, I just wanted to highlight the wonderful Susan Dodsworth, who works with me in a partnership with the Westminster Foundation, um, has done some fantastic research on regional imbalances in election observation. Many of us have had a hunch for a long time that international election observation is actually done in a varied way, that African elections might be treated in a different way to others. Susan is the first person that we know of that's actually bothered to go out and collect the data to prove it. And what she shows using regression analysis of elections in Africa from 1991 to 2012 is that there is a significant effect of an election being in sub-Saharan Africa, a significant negative effect on the likelihood that international election observers will call that election out. So let me show you what that looks like. The black line here is all the probability of an, uh, a fraud being alleged against an election in the whole world. The red line here is the probability of fraud in Africa being called out. What you can see here is that for each quality of election, so for every standard of election we see, so holding that constant, looking at, okay, elections of this quality in the world compared to this quality in Africa, at every single level, the gap is significant. But in particular, Susan here has highlighted, at the quality of election 0 0.3, so this is a 0 to 1 scale, at 0 0.3, the difference between a likelihood, so these are predicted probabilities of an election being called out in Africa is 26% lower than in the rest of the world. That's something that we really need to think about and understand and go back to the International Election Observer community and say, how do we explain why it's 26% lower in sub-Saharan Africa than elsewhere? And to do that, we're very excited to tell you that we're working on a new organization which is called ELECTA, the Election Observation Resource Center, Research Center, which we're setting up hopefully with the Westminster Foundation of Democracy, our long-term partners, and the Open Society Foundation, who are excited about the opportunity of doing this, to actually create a much more effective link between academics 
and election officials around the world to share the kind of research that we've been doing so that they can use it to do a more effective job and also so that we can learn from them about how to understand the challenges and the pressures that they face. It may be the case, for example, that one of the reasons we see that finding in sub-Saharan Africa is perfectly reasonable concerns about impacts of declaring elections to be unfree on political stability. And finally, a kind of personal plea, seeing as it's like my time and it's now up, um, one of the things that we also need to do is communicate more effectively outside of the academy and with people who are working in new democracies. Uh, the ivory tower of academia has been rather impervious to people in places like sub-Saharan Africa for too long, and that needs to change. A very small thing that we do to try and change that is this blog, Democracy in Africa. We relaunched it today in honor of the lecture, so if you go on, you'll see a whole new set of wonderful stories written by wonderful authors from all over the world, including on the continent. If you would like to write for us, please do. Um, but it's part of our attempt to generate a stronger conversation between students, academics, and democracy promoters all over the world. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mark Weber. I'm the head of the School of Government and Society of which uh, IDD is part and uh, in which Nick is a valued member. Uh, it's my job in a moment to say some words by way of uh, closing proceedings. But uh, first of all, Nick has agreed to take some questions. Uh, I'm here to moderate, but that may not even be necessary. Um, uh, no one's going to throw anything at Nick, and he certainly won't throw anything back. Um, so we have, I guess, five minutes or so. Um, I've been told to speak to the microphone, but I guess you could hear me anyway. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, uh, could you? Make yourself known, and then Nick will give it his best shot. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Professor Nick Cheeseman. Um, the lecture was brilliant. Uh, my question is, how do you carry along the communities when you're actually trying to change these processes? So, for example, you give an example of um, how one can one can make sure that the votes he bought are actually, are actually given. So if the, if the community is participating in that kind of activities, then how can you then carry them along in the long-term solutions that you're trying to implement to make sure they work? That's a good question. So if the community is sometimes involved in manipulation, how do you turn that around? It's very, very difficult. Right? And I think one of the things that we've been engaged in a conversation with international observers and international donors about is how do you stop things like vote buying? And I think one of the messages we, we've put out there, which is not, it doesn't go down that well, is that workshops are not going to do it, right? Training people for a day around elections is not going to do it. Civic education for a short time is not going to do it. Because actually, if, like President Museveni, you can tap into an understanding of legitimate leadership, and if you can give money in a way that combines that, um, with people's concern for the elections then and a sense of authoritarianism and therefore a sense of fear, a small amount of education isn't going to be enough. Um, I think one of the things that we have seen, though, is opposition parties learning and using really impressive strategies in some places. So if you go back to Namibia, when SWAPO uh, was in opposition and the DTA was in power, one of the slogans used by SWAPO was, eat DTA, vote SWAPO. Right? You, you know the ballot is secret, so take all of their money, take as much of it as you can, take all of their food, but vote your own way. So you don't try and interrupt the electoral ritual of vote buying, you don't interrupt the electoral ritual of gifting, but you say to people, remember that your vote is secret. Now that of course only works where people believe the ballot box is sacrosanct. A great example from Zambia, which is very similar, is the Don't Kabeba campaign, which we saw in 2011, when Michael Sata and Guy Scott said to people, you know, Don't Kabeba. You take what they want you to take, but don't tell them that you're then going to vote for us, right? Because the opposition simply couldn't compete when it came to resources. So I think, in a way, a more effective strategy uh, is not don't take the bribe, don't play your part in the electoral ritual. It's vote with your conscience. But for that to hold up, we have to protect the ballot box. And sometimes the different things that we do as an international community and as electoral officials work against each other. So let me give you an example. To reduce queues, there is a big drive now to have more polling stations. More polling stations allows you to have less people 
300 people maybe at a polling station, and it allows you to count the votes very quickly and have very small queues. But it also does two other things. It creates additional polling stations that somebody has to monitor, party agents and observers, and it also means that you get a smaller and smaller unit of voters. So whereas if you're in a 20,000 constituency and you don't vote for President Mugabe, it might be hard to tell, if you're in a constituency with 300 people at the polling station and the results are released at the polling station level, all of a sudden, 20, 30 people not voting the right way allows a form of collective punishment that again undermines the secrecy of the ballot. So I think we have to think really carefully about how the different reforms that we're pushing, all of which are for good reasons, might actually interact and in some cases undermine some of the other goals that we have. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my name is Eric, and I come from Cameroon. What's your take on the fact that the, uh, the party in power actually creates alternative parties so that they share the, the remaining votes while they take the majority of it? Because that's what is kind of happening in my country, and there's someone who's been there for 36 years and still planning to go for another seven terms. So we have so many parties and they share a chunk, a little bit of the votes, and he takes the majority. Could that be, be termed as, as rigging as well? Absolutely, and creating lots of parties is really smart, right? Because there are lots of rules that you often see in an election that say things like coverage should be distributed equally. Now, what you don't want as an incumbent is your opponent to get half the coverage. But if you can create five or six or seven new parties that are actually allied to you, the equal coverage means that he's only getting maybe one-tenth or one-twentieth of the coverage, and then, of course, you know, and we saw that in Zimbabwe. I mean, there was kind of equal coverage of the opposition. There was only really one credible opposition party. So if you get equal coverage of the candidates, it actually, to some extent, is discriminating against the candidate that's most likely to win. But Cameroon, I was just on the way here, and I got called by someone from Cameroon who told me, and I was going to mention this in the talk, but I was talking for too long, so thank you for the question, that not only are parties being created in Cameroon, but observers are being created in Cameroon, right? Because what we saw over the last 24 hours is reports by an organization that purported to be from Transparency International, who most of you will know is the International Corruption Organization, but appear, I say appear, we don't yet know, to be an organization created by the Cameroonian government to look international and give a positive evaluation of the Cameroonian elections. Now, this is actually a strategy we talk about in the book. We see this all across parts of Europe, where what we call zombie observers are basically set up by authoritarian governments or groups of authoritarian governments to go to countries and give positive evaluations of elections that are flawed. And of course, it's a really clever strategy because as most of you will know, the international media, if it's going to report on someone like Cameroon, and Cameroon is not going to get many headlines despite you know, the terrible violence that's being committed to the Anglophone community there right now. One of the things that's going to get you headlines is black and white stories. These guys did something wrong, these guys did something right. If you can muddy that water, if you can make it gray, the media will tend not to carry that story. And that's what he's trying to do. Let's have some observers who come out and say the election's great quality. All of a sudden, the media is forced with a headline, faced with a headline that says, international observers confused or unsure about quality of Cameroon elections, or international observers disagree over quality of Cameroon elections. And as soon as you have that storyline, it ceases to be something you can sell to the wider world. So the rise of zombie observers and the question of who is actually legitimate is important and fits in with the trend of fake news, right? It's increasingly difficult to hold people to account, partly because the narrative of the election is difficult. But it's not just Cameroon. I mean, in the United States, after winning, Donald Trump claimed to have won the popular vote on the basis of millions of people illegally voting. Right? Now, as far as we know, in most parts of the United States, even in places of vast, vast electorates, the number of people illegally voting in audits that have been done is minuscule. And yet, he went out to make that statement. So the problem is not just something that we're facing out there in Cameroon, it's also something we're facing in Washington. Nick, um, great talk. Um, and research is really important in this area. To what extent do you think um, authoritarian governments are reading our research and thinking, ah, 
this is good, we should do this, or we shouldn't do that. And how do we get around that catch-22? That was a great question. I was asked this uh, in, uh, when I went to um, Zimbabwe once, right? Aren't you worried that, you know, President Menengago will get a copy of the book? And as you know, <laughs> President Menengago wrote this book 20 years ago, right? He doesn't need a copy of this from me. Um, I think that, you know, the, the situation is that most of the leaders that we're talking about actually understand this better than us. And they have a hundred strategies that we don't even have in the book up their sleeves. So there is a slight risk um, of putting it out there and explaining different ways that you can make strategies more effective. Um, but my sense is that in general, people actually have a really good sense of how this works. And my, I mean, the reason why we wrote the book was because we got fed up of going to elections where this was happening where the observers, you know, for maybe good or bad reasons, ended up not making unequivocal statements, and where election after election we would see the same recommendations being made but then not enforced, and then the observers coming again and seeing similar processes. And, and so we wanted to kind of say, you know, it's almost like a scream, you know, like, hang on a minute, guys, what, it, what is exactly the game that we've got ourselves locked into playing? And I think our decision was that it was much, you know, the, the risk of authoritarians reading the book and finding new strategies was you know, worth taking to try and kickstart a conversation about the way we need to reform election observation. Now, I don't think we can take any credit. You know, our book has not sold anywhere near enough copies to suggest that we've encouraged people to take this issue up as a debate. But the fact that at meetings like the one I was in yesterday, people are actually putting on the table the need for radical reform of election observation says to me that people across academia and across election observation world collectively making these comments and collectively talking about the challenges we face has generated a fresh opportunity that maybe wasn't there five years ago to actually do something that would be really interesting, right? So for example, do we need to have international observers sprinkled all across the country as we do now, or could we have them as a kind of bastion of expertise in capital cities monitoring stuff like social media and monitoring the election technology using much more partnerships with domestic observers to actually do the coverage of the country? Because the domestic observation teams have thousands of people and the international observers have a much smaller number. Is there a way that we can develop more sustainable and stronger models of domestic observation going forwards? Because it's much more effective if African observers speak out on African issues than if we do. Because the anti-colonial card and the kind of idea of external oppressors can always be used to delegitimize international observers, but it can't be used for domestic observers. So that's got to be the long-term game, right? Empowering local forces rather than this being a long-term international observation. And I think we can now have those conversations. So I think it was worth the risk. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say a few words by way of conclusion. I realize I am the last thing between you and the free drinks. Um, so I promise I'll be quick. And my apologies to the people here who did want to ask a question. Maybe if you grab Nick by the pop-up bar, uh, you may have the opportunity uh, to talk to him. Um, I, this is uh, officially called uh, the, the, the vote of thanks. Um, and it has a slightly uh, stuffy uh, title, I guess. And often uh, inaugural lectures can be very stuffy. People wear robes. It is an inauguration into the professoriate uh, of this great university. Uh, I'm not going to add to uh, that, that pomposity in any sense. This has not been a pompous lecture by any means. Uh, it's in a terrific um, venue, a very modern. Uh, no one is wearing a robe. Um, what you have seen here uh, is a great example uh, of cutting edge political science. Uh, so it's both forward-looking uh, and also uh, draws upon some classic scholarship uh, in the field. I'm going to wrap it up with what may seem a, a rather enigmatic uh, finish. Uh, I've been to a few inaugurals uh, in my time. Uh, a great friend and colleague of mine uh, gave her an inaugural in which he said, uh, in entering into the professoriate, he felt he had three obligations. Uh, the first was to the institution, which had conferred the title. Uh, the second were to the colleagues, which that uh, the, the, the new professor had worked with in the past and in the present and in the future. And in a way, those two are quite straightforward. They're not always easy to achieve, but they're easy to understand. Uh, the third one is a little more elliptic, and, and this is the idea that you have an obligation to your subject. And I've often wondered what that means exactly, um, an obligation to your subject, because, of course, a lot of scholars feel that they're iconoclastic in some way, they come into research, they come into uh, 
uh, academia to escape the conformity and the rules and so on because uh, uh, academia is still uh, oasis uh, where certain flexibility is accorded to free thinking and academic freedom, of course, is enshrined in what we do. Um, so what does it mean to be obliged to your subject in a way? And there's no easy to answer that, to that other than through observation, because I think today you have seen a very good example uh, of somebody uh, who respects in, uh, his subject, uh, drawing upon not only his own terrific work, but that of his contemporaries, that of his peers. Uh, and to me, it's pretty clear uh, that a great scholar like Nick uh, does exactly that respects his subject, and his subject respects him back. Uh, hence all the plaudits uh, he has got uh, for his scholarship uh, more recently. Listening to it, I think there's also a fourth uh, element to this. Uh, it seems that Nick doesn't simply have an obligation to his subject, as well as his colleagues and his institution, but there's, there's clearly a sense of deep political morality, actually, uh, in what he was conveying, which became more and more evident, I think, uh, as the lecture proceeded. This wasn't just an example of very dry scholarship and lots of data and so on. I thought it ended uh, with quite an important political message uh, about the obligations we as citizens, but also as engaged scholars, uh, have to the great issues of the day. Um, so that maybe is the fourth obligation. It's not an easy one uh, for any or all of us to, uh, to take forward, but it was clear to me that that was a driving force uh, of Nick's work, other than simply uh, the, the, the great standards of scholarship which were also on display. Um, I think it's also opportune, lastly from me, I mean, Nick has joined uh, a terrific department, uh, IDD. Uh, I was on his interview panel. Uh, he and I had long chats uh, uh, upon his arrival. He is one of the very few people who recognize the obscure, dusty corner of my bookshelf with some uh, fairly dusty and obscure books on African politics from the 50s and 60s, some of which he took away. Uh, since he has arrived, he has been a great servant to the department, the school, and the college, and the university, um, and has added to what I think has been a terrific uh, few years for the department, uh, which does uh, great teaching, great scholarship, uh, and is under great leadership. And Nick has been able to flourish uh, in that environment. So insofar as this is a vote of thanks, I would like uh, to ask you to join me uh, in thanking Nick for a terrific lecture.